Kai, it's good to see you again on this almost wintry day. It's one mm, of the first really. really nasty days of the season. We ought to be home under a very comfortable blanket or something on this such a day. I'm glad you could get here. Thanks and for having me. My pleasure. And in the audience, welcome very much to our conversations. Pleasure to welcome to the program again a friend of mine and of the world. And he's been a guest in the past of conversations and other venues, television. It's Kai Hainer. He's the director, he's an economist, and he's the director of the Henry George School here in New York City. And he's been interested in Henry George. I see from his bio, his father was a Georgist, or grandfather. Grandfather, was, yeah. Grandfather was a Georgist. And he's going to help bring us into uh, understanding better this giant of an economic theoretician, Henry George. And we're going to be talking about that and relating it to the current situation. I would presume we'll want to do that. But Kai, welcome very much once again to Conversation. Thank you. Share briefly your background, please. Not a long thing, but a uh, long, but you're European, but you I was uh, German born, German born, and I, I got a master's in economics on uh, classical economics, Adam Smith and David Hume, and I uh, had a, uh, wrote a PhD 12 years on the ideological origin of the Holocaust. Yeah, right, huge subject, yeah. Huge subject, mm -hmm. and a uh, heavy duty subject. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been uh, running various schools, uh, and the last five and a half, six years, I've been uh, director of the Henry George School in New York City here, Henry George School of Social Science. You were here earlier. Uh, it was yeah. some decade ago before yes. you became your PhD, I think. Yes, yeah. I was in the 90s. I was here. I was uh, working as a journalist, and I was teaching at the Henry George School part-time. I see. Yeah, you were a journalist then. Yeah. But you've been interested in Henry George a good deal of your adult life? Then? Yes, 20 it years now. Yeah. 20 yeah. years now. Okay, maybe you could share with us. When did you, uh, you took your degree, bachelor's in economics, huh? Master's in economics. Master's yes. in economics, yeah. and you had done that kind of work I at the undergraduate level as well? Yes, yes. And you've been sort of, in a certain sense, interested in economics? Yes. Most all the time. Yes, yes. I think it's important. It used to be called political economics in the 19th century because they linked the two at the hip. And I think it's, in a certain sense, uh, appropriate that we see it that way because the economics, and then the e economics discipline and the economic theory that informs the economic discipline also then mightily informs the political oh, uh, dialectic, doesn't it? Yeah, they're, they, they're, they're connected, yeah. It used to be called, political economy was the word for economics or classical economics. In the 18th and 19th century, the word for economics was political economy, but yeah. it's pretty much the same subject. Yeah, yeah. And then probably we could know at a philosophical level yes. that that political economics or that linking of those two disciplines, let's say, uh, is, as we know, is nested within larger elements because everything, all of reality in a certain sense, is interconnected to everything else. Yes. So in a real sense, the uh, breaking down of things into economic disciplines does not comport with the way the world is really set up. We do it for our convenience of trying to bring conscious understanding to the process. I, I guess that's fair to say. Yes, that's a, that's a good way of putting it. You have the, the distinction that was uh, used for a long time is microeconomics and macroeconomics. Yes. And political economy, the classical economists, Adam Smith, David Hume, uh, David Ricardo, and so on, they are really, they had the macroeconomic perspective. Okay. And in the 20th century, we have uh, neoclassical economics, and that's mostly micro. Well, we're looking at businesses in microeconomics, but we're looking at um, nations and national economies in macroeconomics. Okay, in macro, we're looking macro. at the larger system. We're looking, we're, 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 we're looking at the big picture. Yeah, I did a program once with uh, William Baumel. I don't mm -hmm. know, he's a major microeconomist. Okay. So he's talking about the. Uh, Sony Corporation or IBM or yes, this kind yes, of thing, yes, and yes. people are doing that. But the macroeconomics is trying to get at a sense of uh, the larger patterns of um, the way the nations relate and yes. the people relate and so forth. Yes. And you say the classical. It might be good because we're going to have a clip. We have a brief yes. clip that's going to be talking about that. Uh, and you said Adam Smith, Ricardo, and then you said David Hume. Yes. David Hume was Scott. Yeah. And uh, also was Adam Smith, for that yeah, matter. And yeah. the Scottish Enlightenment was very important in terms of the, uh, you know, coming out of the feudal period. Yes. But th what 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 is it that makes uh, th th their thinking? It, that sounds early. Yeah. In terms of 1776, wealth of nations. 
What makes the classic, uh, you call it, we call it classical the same way we call Greco-Roman classical because it's the early establishment of the discipline or the understanding? Or when we say classical, maybe you could clear that up for us. Yes. Uh, wh what's the meaning of the word classic? Or classical is, is uh, Beethoven's music is, is, is classical music, or Mozart's music is classical yeah. music because why? In spades. Yeah, <laughs> it, 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 it withstands the test of time. Okay. We don't know if the latest hip hop or the latest rap music is classical, not because it's not good, but because we haven't had generations to listen in on it. Right. So we will know present day music to be classical only in a few generations. Okay, yeah, and right. And right. those theorists, those thinkers that have been referred to over and over and over again in different cultures and in different um, societies and different historic periods, they're called classic. Mm -hmm. and, and Adam Smith is probably the first grand classic economist in that sense. Yeah, before that we had the feudal period. Yes. Really, we were coming out of a feudal period. Yes. Uh, dynastic states, yes. that kind yes. of thing. Yes. So it was the beginning of what was called the Enlightenment, I think, in, yes. in an economic sense. So uh, what you had actually was um, what's now called the Dark Ages. You, that was the feudal period, yeah. and the church was reigning, and monarchies was re were reigning. Yeah. And then you had pretty much the Renaissance in Italy, and then the Renaissance in the North, and then with the Renaissance came rationalism and the age of so-called Age of Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. And that really cleared the way to look not only at dynasties and look only at monarchies, but look at what the people were doing with their um, businesses. Yeah. And that's, uh, we have the, the early schools before the classical economists in modern economics are the mercantilists and the physicrats. Okay, yeah, right, okay. Yeah. And, and then Smith was, actually Smith's merit is that he captured the early schools and he synthesized the early schools. Okay. The mercantilists say basically uh, trade is the only thing that's important, wealth comes from trade, trading, champion the trader. The physicrats say physio means nature or, or ground. So the physicrats say uh, let the farmer uh, uh, be wealthy, the f all wealth comes from nature, all wealth comes from the land. Mm -hmm. And then Adam Smith came and that was just before the Industrial Revolution and he said building on Hume, wealth is really a component that comes from several factors and nature is one, trade is one, and the other one is that really the entrepreneur, the industrialist is really the key figure here. That's interesting. So yeah, that's the right. early early days of capitalism, pre-capitalism that right. Smith was, was envisioning here. With his pin factory and but uh, but uh, it was also the year uh, 1776 was the year of the publication. They had a revolution across the Atlantic in America that was significant to this country and to the world. I would think because Absolutely. and then also they had the invention of the steam engine was up in Scotland yes, as yes, well. Yes, and uh, that was the harbinger of the industrial revolution that was going to come. And as they say, uh, who was it? Jerry Lee Lewis has said. A whole lot of shaking going on. There are a lot of things were going to be coming off that, and we're still living in the uh, we're still living in the wake of that. Yes, uh, that yes. that major period of transformation. Politically, we have the American experience that seems to be wanting to see itself as a model for the world, and the economics. There's been some changes within economic theory. Uh, one of which, of course, is Henry George, who was a giant, Louis, yes. Louis, uh, yes. Tolstoy, and so forth. We're going to get to him, obviously, because yes. that's yes. your thing. But we had others. We had Karl Marx, and yes. then we had Keynes, and we had all the rest. Uh, how do we put the others? If that was classical, and again, classical, you think of the Greco-Roman that was uh, maybe carried largely by Islamic uh, when you know after the uh, downfall of uh, Rome, let's say, or Greece. But that was a classical period. But then the neoclassical, or how do we, on the basis of what do we differentiate the other schools that emerged in terms of the theoretical basis that informed them? For instance, Marx, or Keynes, mm -hmm. or Schumpeter, is, or Van is, Hayek, is, or is Friedman, or is, that. Is not and then we'll talk to George, which you think is somebody who is a major figure. I think Leo Tolstoy said he's one of the major figures in the history of mankind, yes. after Plato and a couple of others between. Yes. Yes. Uh, major figure, and you're familiar with him. We want to understand his take on it very clearly. Yes. But could you clear up that period between the classical, Ricardo, and the other things, and then we'll get to this giant of a figure, um, uh, Henry George. Thanks Thanks for the question. That's, it's fairly easy to do. You could, you could do it by time. 
you could say the 18th and the 19th century is the classical period. Okay. Starting with Hume, Smith, <coughs> Ricardo, John Stuart Mill, Karl Marx, Henry George. You it put Henry George in that group? It's all okay. one school. Okay. And okay. if you want Marx and then George are the capstone of the classical economists, and that's the end of the 19th century. Marx and Henry George. Henry George. They're the capstone of the classical economists. Uh, Adam Smith, Ricardo, and Hume are the beginning. That's classical. They're the outset of the classical school. That's at the beginning of the 19th century, uh, 18th cen late 18th century, 1776, 1780s. Yeah. Yeah. And George and Marx are the end of that. And it's, there's no, it's not, an, not a coincidence. It's uh -huh. not a, an accident uh -huh. that 1776 was the revolution in the United States, and 1789 was the Declaration of the Rights of Men in France. In France, in and they cut off Louis the sixth er, head. That's related to each other because the human being came into the picture of the thinkers. Human being came into the picture as as uh, of being of self value. The human beings came in on their own without it being kings or or being related to the church or whatever. Yeah. Human life was started to be looked at as a, a value in itself, mm -hmm. human dignity. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. based on that came the idea, okay, we need a science of man, we need a social science, we need a societal science, mm -hmm. we need an economic science. Mm -hmm. So that was mm -hmm. 18th, 19th century, to go back to your questions, was mm -hmm. the, the, the classical economist, then end of the 19th century, the Austrian school, Hayek, uh, von Mises. Schumpeter. Schumpeter a little later, mm. they, the Austrian school, they became the neoclassical economists. And then we have Keynes, who was, who was a reformer, who was a progressive, is the middle of the 20th century. So the neoclassicals and the, the reformers on the 20th century, and that ends with Milton Friedman and the monetarists. Okay, and meet Milton Friedman and the monetarists that have been in the saddle under Mr. Bush and so forth, it seems to me, and everything lately uh, in the last decade or so, uh, is beyond the period of Keynes. Yes. I can remember Mr. Nixon one time saying in 1972, we're all Keynesians now. That's true. That's so true. that's been part of the meter. Then we've had political figures in there. We had Roosevelt, who yes. came after the Great Depression of 1929. Many people said, as they're saying about Mr. Obama now, we're going to want to bring it up to date, that they, Mr. Roosevelt saved capitalism mm -hmm. by the efforts that he made with the New Deal and so forth. And a lot of people are saying that apparently the Dow hit 10,000 yesterday, as you and I speak, yes. that they averted a great major depression that okay. had been characteristic, and that Mr. Obama saved capitalism, perhaps. I, I'm getting a little afield there. But, um, and that, uh, you, you, so, so Henry George figures in between those two, yes. in a sense, yes. and he was the major figure and I wonder if maybe you could uh, talk about Henry George. I suppose you have no uh, no problem with that. No. Or we, do we have a clip? Yeah, I think maybe, maybe we, should show the better. we should show the clip first, and then we can. Uh, we have a clip, and maybe as you can say, s set it up for us, Kai. Uh, we have a clip here that just uses uh, it's it's a couple of minutes, and it's just basically a mini lecture on classical economics by S yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah. it's it's a couple of uh, it's it's just to set up the basic principles of what economics is about. And if we have seen that, once we have seen that, I think it's easier to then have we can discussion. come back and take yes. that question I yes. gave you. So maybe you can run that if you can, Willie. Set it up and run that. We're talking with Kai Hainer of the uh, Henry George School. But we run. We have been running a course please. at the Henry George School. We have been and rewriting and, and rewriting. I have been rewriting a, a course on the Henry George School mm -hmm. on the history mm -hmm. of economic thought. We've been running it three terms, and it starts really with the inquiry: whom of the great economists have not done their homework? Because given the world situation the way it is, given the national economies the way they are, given the dismal state of economics and the economies, somebody must not have done their homework. And it was interesting researching for the course. I came really to a very strange conclusion. The conclusion was none of them have done their homework. Mm. And I'm just going to concentrate on two of the giants. I'm going to concentrate on Adam Smith on the right, father of capitalism, so-called, and Karl Marx on the left, father of communism. And they both haven't done their homework. And it's dismal. And one of the 
side effects of the course was that I found out how the Cold War could have been avoided. Namely, if we had gotten economic principles right in the first place, we would not have had a Cold War. Hmm. This idea, this idea that um, labor and capital are antagonistic and they cannot cooperate is simply nonsense. And we're going to look at Karl Marx, how he came from Adam Smith, but we also have to look a little bit at, at how Karl Marx came from Hegel. And unfortunately, he didn't understand Hegel well. Karl Marx took Hegel's dialectics and he took the law of contradictions that Hegel uses in history, in the realm of the spirit. He takes that, puts it into economics, and then he comes up with his irreconcilable contradictions. Thesis, capital, antithesis, labor. Synthesis, communism. This is, um, you could cry over this. You could really cry over this. Hegel would turn in his grave. We have three factors of production, land, labor, and capital. All the classical economists agree on that. The ones who got it most nearly right before George were Ricardo and Stuart Mill. Now Smith, coming from Hume, says land, labor, and capital, and then he forgets about it. He does this whole big thing at the beginning of, of The Wealth of Nations, and then he distinguishes nicely and neatly, and then he forgets about it. And for all practical purposes, he subsumes everything under capital. And that's like saying, this is a lectern, these are tables, and these are chairs. And now I'm saying, this is a chair, this table is a lectern, and the chairs are tables. Or I'm saying everything is a, a thing. So I'm not getting very far with my analysis. And it's not, just, it's not just words, it's not just hot air, it's not just something for professors, it's not just hair splitting. It's a, a misunderstanding that very gravely affected our reality in not distinguishing properly between land and wealth and capital, things man-made and things not man-made. This really created the excuse to rape our planet. Mm. It gave the theory. It gave the theory to rape our planet. That's very interesting. It gave the theory to rape our planet. Yeah. And if I hear it right, I mean, um, I hear you saying uh, land, uh, capital, and labor. Yes. Um, okay. Let me just pose an innocent question or something. If if land is um, becomes private property or something there's an ownership a title to it and so forth yeah why is is land a a, a, a word to include all natural resources yes absolutely. Yeah. okay so that would mean all natural re okay that's different than land in the sense but the land can be owned by someone so that if you have the the, the property is owned by a title or something why is that not just a capital instrument? And what distinguishes it? And if you could deal with that. Because yes. uh, to say land, capital, and labor, most people you would say labor and capital. That's, that's the crucial you see? question. And that's, that's the crucial question. Straighten us out and, and, and how we might have avoided so much of the uh, inappropriate way in which we organize ourselves according, I guess, to you and to Henry George. Yes. Uh -huh. That's that's not that is the all crucial question. That's the fault line between classical economics and neoclassical okay. economics, mm -hmm. because all classical economists work from land, labor, capital, and all neoclassical economists work from labor, capital, and they leave out land. Now let's go back. Okay, that's good. Okay, I'm learning. Yeah, thank let's, you. Yeah. Let's get let's get back mm -hmm. a step. Go back a step and and ask ourselves what is the economy for. You, oh, you want me to talk or no? Well, sure, no. Yeah, well, to provide goods and services to the people. Exactly. Oh. And, and in other words, the economy is for to provide goods and services for the people. It's to fulfill their needs. Yes? Right. Now, we have anthropologists are telling us for 250,000 years we have had 
civilizations and societies that were civilized and cultures for 250,000 years. We well, wait a minute, wait a minute. That, that, that's wrong, not 250,000 years. That's what they're telling us. Some are saying 150,000 years, some are saying 250,000 years. Not civilization. Yes, we don't have, the, the written history is only 5,000 years or 10,000 years, but yeah, 10, there 000, are, if yeah. you go to the archaeologists, they will find traces of culture or something oh, that goes well, yeah. way back. Yeah, Homo sapien evolved Thank about 200,000 <coughs> years ago Thank in you. Africa, and we're all descendant of that gene pool. Thank yeah. you. Now, we have all these societies. But it wasn't civilization. I don't want to split terms. That usually means city dwelling and culture and everything. And that most of that time, we were probably running away from big cats well, and were prey most of that time. The point is that, that man is maybe has been intelligent longer than we think. And, Perhaps, and all yeah. these societies organize, if it doesn't matter if it's 250,000, 150,000 years, or 100,000 years, or yeah. 50,000 years. Okay. As long as we have had cultural and civilizational life, any group of human beings need an, an economy to satisfy their needs. Correct. Yeah. yeah. As now, every other creature does. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Now, while we are organizing ourselves maybe a little more, a little better than some other creatures, but maybe not too well, anyway. What are the basic needs? The basic needs are air, water, food, shelter, and clothing. Mm, okay? Yeah, yeah. Now, that's the difference between <coughs> the classical school and the neoclassical school. We're going to have, according to estimations of demographers, we're going to have 7 billion people on the planet very shortly, maybe yeah. a year, a couple of years. By the year 12,050, we're supposed to have 12 billion people. I haven't seen that. I see it around between between 9 and 10 billion the UN says. It's going to level off. It's going to level off at some yeah. point, right? Yeah. But it, it means that it's an awful lot of people. It's, yeah, yeah, more, yeah. Oh, yes, right. It's more than you and I. Y yes, correct, yes. If you go out in the subway in, in New York, you'll, you'll get a sense of, of population or overpopulation. Mm. So the classical school says, okay, basically the task of economics the, 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 the thinking about the economy, the theory of the economy, the task of economics is to give clean air, clean water, food, shelter, and clothing to seven billion people. Yeah? Okay. Mm -hmm. And now the neoclassicals say, starting with the, with, the, uh, with the Austrians, von Mises, and so on in Vienna, they're sitting in Vienna, and that's really... Uh, and Hayek? Yeah, Hayek. It's a different... As well. Yes, it's, yes, it's a different... Uh, it's a different approach. They are basically saying uh, they're working for the leisure class, for the conspicuous consumption crowd. They're working for the, the mentality is Marie Antoinette who says uh, people don't have bread, let them eat cake. So yeah. in other words, yeah. they are the well-to-do who, who live off, who leech off other people's labor, and they actually have economic choices. And they're, they're free in that sense. In that sense, they're have a freedom. Yeah, they are free. They they live off other people. They 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 are. You can say they have, they live off unearned income, and they they have the choice. What is the the uh, uh, marginal utility theory? You eat ten sandwiches, and the eleventh sandwich is going to be of less utility. It's going to have a more marginal utility than the other ten. Yeah, but that that utility thing came in. Didn't didn't they uh, didn't they uh, see see things a, a little bit different? earlier I mean it's just um, um, it, it, you, you, or Marx came in I don't know where he comes in that you the, the principle uh, there is a thing called the labor theory of value that, that is part of what informs a lot of economics that would, and that but that's classical labor. economics that's, that's classical. classical that's not neoclassical I'm, I'm going I'm, I'm just making oh, a step from the Marxism. classical to to the okay. Marxism is classical and we're going into the Austrians now the Austrians are saying Basically, in a sense, it's it's if I'm starving, if if a billion people on this planet don't have clean water, if 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 a significant number of these have their children are starving, they they can't even fulfill their primary needs, mm -hmm. then they're not concerned with the eleventh sandwich. They're not concerned with marginal utility because okay. the primary utilities haven't been haven't been been satisfied. Yeah, they have to have their their you know they have to have the ability you know, to distribute according to need. And uh, now the neoclassicals are saying, uh, from the standpoint of the rich, from the well-to-do, okay, we we don't worry about it. It's all a matter of choice. Economics is nothing but a matter of individual choices. You can't have a big overarching ideology like Marx and the even Adam Smith for the neoclassicals is too macroeconomic. Mm -hmm. 
Now, the classicals are saying, on the other hand, we can start to worry about the marginal utility of the 11th uh, sandwich for the rich and, and well-to-do after we have given air, water, food, shelter, and clothing to everybody who's on the planet. Mm -hmm. So that's a, it's a completely different approach. And the, the, the neoclassicals are saying, okay, this is really psychology, it's a matter of choice, and it's individualistic, and so on. And the classicals are saying it's an exact science because if you don't get air, you're dead in five minutes. If you don't get water, you're dead in three days. If you don't get food, you're dead in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. If you don't have shelter and clothing in a New York night, mm -hmm. you're dead in one night. Mm -hmm. So there yeah. are objective needs that have to be fulfilled right. for seven billion people. And right. it's an objective science. And we, do we have the capacities, the productive capacities, and the technological capacities to fulfill the needs of seven billion people on mm -hmm. their primary level? Mm -hmm. And everybody says yes to that. We have the resources, we have the capacities, what we're not doing right, we have the production, but we don't have the distribution. We have don't we distribute. Yeah, that's right. right. Have we always had that throughout all of human history? Because if I look back, and James Joyce said history is a nightmare from which I'm attempting to awaken, and it's always, it seems to me, we don't have much idea of what there was before civilization, but it, there history was always- History is a nightmare. That's a very good that, 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 very that good it was quote. always a matter of some small group of people, whether they're pharaoh or a king or mm -hmm. whatever, who lived very well in a castle, a castle or something, and the masses of the people were their su their their subjects, almost slaves. Yeah. And um, the few people lived very very well, and it never served very well, except some did, as they would say, trickle down and everything. But they didn't live very well, and they don't now. No. And that there were there are some who live very well. And most of the people do not, and the, it's a different thing if you're trying to take into account the needs of everybody rather than the needs of uh, the few leadership elements that see themselves rightly as legitimate in a historical order, that they're the leadership elements, and they should live in those very uh, you know, favored positions, and that still applies to the world now, as you and I talk in the year 2009, as it did over the, over the centuries. It's always been like that. No, uh, Henry George would challenge that. Henry good. George well, then that's why we want to talk about Henry George. Exactly. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we have this one of the most <coughs> misquoted um, economic passages in the Bible is, the poor will always be with us. Yeah. That's the Christ speaking, the poor will always be with us. Now, watch when is he saying that. The night of Gethsemane, the next morning, he has the vision he's going to be betrayed. Mm -hmm. So he is... He is gathering his disciples around himself and he's saying, for that night, I'm going to give you the last teaching. I'm giving, giving you the Gnostic teaching. That's the last night we're going to be together. For once, don't worry about social issues. For once, don't worry about feeding the poor. Mm -hmm. The poor will always be with us. Don't worry about them. I'm going to give you special instructions. Yeah, the Gnostic Gospels talk that's about that. That's the context it. in which that's that statement the context. was made. Of the, okay, okay. It does not mean, mm -hmm. but it's always twisted into the sense yeah. to say, the Christ condones poverty. Poverty is a God-given thing. C poverty will always be with us. There will always be the few rich and the, the, the middle class that's depressed and the many poor. And that's not As it's always been. Yeah, Almost without exception. Now, now Henry George comes and he says, why has it been so? There were societies in earlier times, in pre-Roman days, which did not have we're coming to private property of land. Uh, w w w was there a just distribution in terms of the whole of the society rather than having the distinctions of those who had and did not have? The economic Nobel Prize uh, that's been given out uh, to, 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 to two gentlemen, a lady and a gentleman in, in the United States, they, they worked about the, on the commons. Now, the commons, the concept of the commons is that there are things that naturally should be held in common. Mm -hmm. The most easy example for uh, 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 the domain of the commons is eminent domain, by the way, is part of that concept oh. of the commons. Okay. Now, one thing we all hold as commons is the air, because if we did yeah, not have, right. if, if yeah. I were a monopolist of the air and I would charge you for every time you breathe. You can make a fortune. Uh, of course I could yeah. make a fortune. and ev Everything anybody had. I yeah. charge a nickel every mm. time you breathe, mm -hmm. and then you run out of nickels. Mm -hmm. You have to run across the street to an ATM machine to get right. more money by the okay. time you're dead. Right, right. So if I right. monopolize the air, I mm. have 
power over life and death. Oh, yeah, power. And, and yeah. that is something that in a democratic society, in, 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 in an economically just society, nobody ever should have. Nobody We've never had an economically just society is what the point I'm making. I mean, it's never been like what the future is offering or that the future that Mr. Henry George might have offered uh, or other or maybe the 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 only possibility short of our uh, you know uh, entropy or something we've never had a real economic order where everybody is getting their needs nor have we had the ability to provide that in terms of our technological capability of providing life support to the people within an, uh, uh, within do you, do you understand what I'm saying I disagree on that okay I, good I, I, I now when was the golden era when we had equity I, I would I would also, Henry George and some, some of the economists in that vein would disagree with them, would, would disagree with you. Yeah. Bef historically, the conception of private ownership of land comes with the Roman law. Roman law, unfortunately, has been copycatted by everybody who came after. Mm -hmm. In ancient Egypt, you didn't have it. In the Mesoamerican societies, the uh, Incas, the Mayas, the Aztecs, you didn't have it. In most societies outside the pale of Roman law, it was natural to have commons. This whole thing with what is it, John Smith giving $24, buying Manhattan for $24 from the Indians, mm. they didn't understand they were selling the land because they didn't have a concept that land can be private property. There is a, there is a, is a, is a, is a, uh, a comparative uh, um, contract that was made with New Zealand uh, Aborigines, Maoris, who the English bought the land from, and then the Maoris put a clause in, every time a baby is born, an indigenous baby is born, the English have to pay again, because that's the commons. If you have no air to breathe, if you not have no water to drink, and if you have no nature to draw your foodstuff from, mm -hmm. you are a slave and you are ultimately dead. Yeah, but the commons could be nested in a whole lot of other things where there's a title deed that's very solid, and those grow into feudal. It used to be feudal where they could distribute land. That was one of the uh, things wanna, they could I wanna do. I want to stay for a moment. I want to stay for And a I don't think those societies, in terms of what Henry George was talking about, maybe not realized by us, maybe we should repair to in order to get to, is something that we don't have precedence for because uh, Babylonia and, uh, and Pharaoh had slaves and you had class in a certain sense. Whether it was using the concept of private property is sort of beside the point. They had the power. Well, to intimidate private and property, uh, private make well the life of those who were close to them, nothing and wrong you had that old there's thing. There's nothing wrong with private. You property. never had justice in the sense of everybody being in a kind of condition that Henry George was maybe alluding to as possible. Private property is correct to have, but private property of what? I want to refer. I want to just stay a little bit with okay. the analysis of the of the resources. Mm -hmm. Nobody has, thank God, nobody has um, privatized air yet. Thank God! Yes, yes, yes. But yeah, now, yeah. what has been privatized, or what was tried to have been privatized, mm -hmm. was water. And one blatant example mm -hmm. is Bolivia. Uh, uh, 5, 10, 20 years ago, Bechtel a Multinational Corporation went into Bolivia. They privatized the water rights, and yeah. they made water so expensive that indigenous people couldn't buy their own water anymore. Yeah, that's true. And great. if you don't have water to drink in three days, you're dead. So in other words, their lifeline was being throttled off. Yeah, but that just gives them a, 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 a good uh, market share now what in their thinking. No, you know? exactly. But yeah. what happened, what, yeah. but in a sense, it's inhumane. And mm -hmm. what happened was uh, the Bolivians went to the street. There were street fights. The police was with, uh, with the multinational corporations, World Bank, IMF, and so on mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. forth. And what happened was the people got killed. Bolivia, Bolivia liberated itself. Bechtel had to give back its rights. Mm -hmm. And it was established that these water rights cannot be privatized because it would be the lifeblood of the Bolivian people. Why don't we apply that to the whole economy? No, that if is, we that is, a, to that the is whole exactly economy, that is a George's that is a George's that's okay. a George's, and George's that's is a George's a principle. Yeah. Here you go. Now yeah. an, another example, take for instance Ecuador. In Ecuador, Correas, President Correas of Ecuador recently has written into the constitution of Ecuador mm -hmm. that the land is for the people. That is another that's another George's measure. In other words, we're trying to prevent if the basis of life is 
air, water, food, shelter, and clothing, then that has to be accessible to all. The moment it's privatized to the point that you can't access anymore, that means your life is threatened. How much is it? Do, do, do we have to do away with private property? No, that's a good. That's a, that's exactly the question. In you're putting the, you're putting the finger on the wound. You're putting the finger on the wound. You're putting, the finger, on, you're, you're putting mm. the finger on the wound. Now, Henry mm. George. W in synchronicity with the with the classical economists Ricardo and Mill mm. and others says makes a very simple distinction very simple distinction the distinction is untouched resources untouched natural resources mm -hmm. we hold in common okay. why should Exxon uh, uh, have rights to all this oil Exxon should have rights to the work they're doing there to the capital input to that they're doing there they should get fruits of the labor that the, that they extracted from the ground and they should get the capital returns but should enron have the rights on on what's in the ground before it's touched no the answer is no yeah yeah okay what what uh, what I, is produced I, yeah, yeah. is ownable whatever you work for okay. by the sweat of your brow right. be it with your brawn or with your brain be uh -huh. it with your hand or be it Plow with, your, with field, your mind whatever, yeah. that's yours mm -hmm. if you have like Unlike uh, Marx, uh, George doesn't say that capital and labor are antagonistic. Capital is just another form of labor. C uh, capital is yesterday's labor. It's stock inventory, what you save for a rainy day. What I you think put they called it congealed labor. Very good. We talk, the I labor think we theory of value here informs you go. the Marx. Here you go. And uh, I, I would say it informs virtually all, with the possible exception of George and others, all economic theory. Yes, yes. Is the labor theory of value is thought of as legitimate. But the thing is, again, to get away from the idea of the land, it's all natural resources you're yes, talking about. Yes, you're not yes. talking just about land. No. Some people get confused with that. No, you're but not that's, just talking th about that's the, that's title deed. And that. that's, that's the the terminology of the classical economist. For the classical economist, the term land was much larger. It yeah, okay, included okay. air, it included water, it yeah. included oil. Okay. It included all natural Everything resources. not man-made. Everything material, okay. not man-made. That's a very important distinction. Yes. And also those er, those those coefficients uh, vary. Yes. When we were on the Serengeti Plain, there wasn't much technology. Yeah, and then, But that's now going to where the technology or the extension of our capability through tools and technology is becoming increasingly responsible for production even from the time when Mr. Henry George was talking. Yes. Uh, land was very important. The Homestead Acts helped. You yes. could spread land and ownership. There yes. was a virgin continent, that kind of thing. But uh, now the thing is going to where the uh, input, to, uh, input to production is increasingly non-labor. Yes. It's technology. You got uh, program computer programs. You've got robotics. You've got all kinds of things that are coming into the productive process. That the labor input to it, either intellectual or physical, is less and less, and yet that is the major component for the means of distributing buying power to the masses of the people. It's through their labor participation. And that they get a, they get for what they do their labor, and then that key, the the capital assets, the technology becomes owned by a few, and you get a concentration of ownership of the real means of production, which is increasingly sidelining labor as an input to production that's through the into the modern experience. That's the crucial point, and that's absolutely the crucial point. That's that's really the 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 the, the bleeding wound, if you want, mm -hmm. and here the the question we have to ask ourselves is. What is the economy for? The economy is there to fulfill human needs. Seven billion, nine billion, whatever. Mm -hmm. The seven needs that we enumerated. Yeah. Uh -huh. Now, the economy is there to serve the people. The people are not there to serve the economy. Money is there to guide the economy to serve the people. Money is there to serve the people. The people are not there to serve money. Now we're coming to Dow Jones hitting, hitting 10,000. 10, Finally, after being down to seven. Yes, yeah. we are. We're, 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 we're looking at the Great at, Depression. We're all. looking at our present time. We're looking at the present economic crisis. And everybody is saying since, what, for, for half a year now, the Dow has been going up. Uh, the crisis is over. We're all uh, happy go lucky. It's like is they fine. said of Roosevelt. He saved capitalism rather than having some common common thing in the name of socialism or communism or something of a Marxian take, I, I saved capitalism, and then now Mr. Obama saved it again by listening to Mr. Summers and Mr. Geithner and all the people who made the problem in, a, in, in terms of, you know, we see it recently, 
but that it underpins virtually all economic theory. And we still think the only way to distribute income to the people outside of the few aristos who mm. own the capital to the people through labor. Okay. And we call that legitimate. We call that earned income rather than non-earned, you know. No, and no, so I, 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 beg to that's the, I beg to differ. That's the problem that we're, we're, we're confronted with because it's out of sync with a world that is rapidly, uh, the, 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 the labor input to production is rapidly deteriorating to the vanishing point. Okay. Now, let's say it deteriorates completely. Let's say we have a few monopolists who own everything and no, n there's nobody who can offer their labor anymore. Are we going to let 7 billion people That's die? That's what we're doing. Are we going to let That's what we're doing. They say so they're I'm saying, okay, I'm mm -hmm. saying with Henry George. Because that money is all accumulating in those hands. Okay, I'm saying with Henry George, capitalism is not salvageable. No matter what uh, uh, President Obama does, no matter what, uh, what FDR did, capitalism is not salvageable. I I've, I've oh, been arguing uh, that point for 20 years. Okay. I found a I found a Okay, I, I that's interesting. That's interesting in these times. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I found an article that goes back almost 100 years by a an economist, German economist named Franz Oppenheimer who worked along very much along the lines of Henry George. He okay. worked on resources, he worked on on redistribution and so on, not communistic, not not uh, command economy stuff. And he wrote a a, a, a long essay which he called neither capitalism nor communism. I have a paper out for 20 years. I've been arguing this beyond capitalism and communism. And I argue also that if you want to understand- Is it published? Yeah, well, it's, 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 it's around. We can, I can I make like it available. I would like to see it. Yes, I, I can make it. Could you make it available to me? Is it a absolute. file? You can just Abs send it to yes, me absolute. on the internet absolute. and I get absolute. it for you. I can have it for nothing? Absolutely. Okay, no you problem. see, that's a very- That would be an example of commons. But yeah, yeah. Now, Yes. There are people who argue, issue, yeah. who analyze Henry George in terms of communism. There are people who are, uh, analyze Henry George in terms of capitalism. And I would say, if you do that, you will miss the best of Henry George. You okay, will not good. understand Henry That's George. That's what we want to understand, yeah. Because both Karl Marx and Adam Smith and the neoclassicals and the monetarists and Kelso, mm -hmm. they all basically exempted, excluded natural resources. Now, if we exclude natural resources, if we make natural resources an externality, as the neoclassical economists They've have been telling us, they've done it with abandon. And you see how, what a miserable state the planet Absolutely. is. Absolutely. When, when, Absolutely. when I was talking about, this is the Hazel theory. Hazel Anderson too. writes yeah, on that the, beautifully. Yeah. Th this, this is the theory. And ecologically, it's coming home to roost, isn't it? Thank you. Yes. This is the theory that was given to us to rape the planet. Now mm -hmm. we have to go back to nature and say, okay, we understand a no-brainer. We understand we can't live without air, water, uh, and food stuff right. that's clean and clear. So we have to reintegrate nature into our experience. Right. Because uh, we, we are part of nature. Right. We are exactly. Not, and exactly. We are, no matter how bionic you're going to be, no matter how many whatever uh, uh, metal parts you're going to have in your body, mm. ultimately you're nature. Right. And, and it's all, a, that's what we introduced, saying it's all a seamless way. Everything's interconnected to everything else, including our species with the others, yeah. And now the, the, what the classical economists have above and beyond the neoclassical economists is that they respect the laws of nature. They do respect the laws of nature, and the neoclassicals don't heed the laws of nature. Now, what you have is if you don't heed the laws of nature, mm -hmm. in the ultimate, you kill yourself. You're sitting on a branch of a large tree, and you're sawing off the branch. Yeah and you fall down. And that's right. what happened to us as mankind. Uh -huh. Now Henry George says if we are able to distribute resources fairly through a simple tax policy, namely we tax the land and we tax resources and we untax production, Henry George is a no tax policy, no production is taxed, no capital gains tax, no income tax, no tax on your labor, no tax on your capital investment. What is the tax on? It taxes only land and natural resources. Natural resources, that would be land and natural resources. Like oil, like, like water, like, like I'll give you two examples. In, in <coughs> we've talked about that before. In, in Alaska, at the end of the year, you get a citizen's dividend for the oil revenues because the oil revenues from the oil companies in Alaska are so rich, they're so magnificent, the mm. surplus is so big, that they are saying, okay, we're giving a couple of thousand dollars per capita per head to every Alaskan citizen. We're giving that back to them because they, as citizens of Alaska, they are entitled to some of the wealth 
that they are sitting on. It was also tied into Mike Gravel and Louis Kelso doing on the pipeline that was necessary in order to get the oil, well, the more that they get the money because they have ownership of the pipeline. So they get that. So right. that is so they coming get that to right. them so through ownership of a capital instrument. Okay. So now we have the and other. And the oil is has is given in um, deals. Untouched and, oil in the ground and, is a resource that shouldn't yeah. be owned by anyone. And but the land is owned. They have title deeds, and they have this. They have all kinds of things that are, you know, the land and the resources, uh, the right to drill. Okay, let's let's uh, look all at, of these things look, look are at, all look, look at look at let's look at this. Let's, let's at the, what's the concept of private property? Now, if 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 we had absolute private ownership of land, I'm not talking about conditional private ownership mm -hmm. of land, which is the, the, the way land is given in most countries. Uh -huh. Absolute private ownership of land, what does that presuppose? It presupposes physical immortality. Let's say you and I own this, this carpet. We own uh -huh. this plot of land. Let's, uh -huh. say, let's say we live to be 100. At 101, we're dead. This carpet, this, this plot of land, I'm not talking about the concrete. I'm not talking well, about Well, you have the, the right to, uh, to, to put it in your will and pass it on to your heirs or whoever you want. You have the right to do what you want that's, with your property. That's true, but if we have, suppose absolute private ownership of land for the next ten thousand years, for the next hundred thousand years, for the next million years, that's our private property. That makes no sense whatsoever. Uh huh. That makes no sense. No, but in other words, uh, yeah. What is it called? A land lockout. It's it's a nature lockout. Future generations are, ha are having to beg. To phantoms, they're having to beg the dead. They're having to beg the people who came first mm -hmm. to breathe. Mm -hmm. They have to beg for the right to live. Uh -huh. Back to the Homestead Act, yeah. 1862. Let's say there was free land available. The indigenous populations of the United States of America were not so populous that not all land was yeah. taken. A lot right. of land was free. Yeah. You ride out in the morning and on, on you ride east following the sun, stake your claim, put your pole in the ground. You ride south w following the sun, stake your claim, and you ride west in the evening, follow the sun, and stake your claim. And that is yours, provided mm. you work it. Yeah. That was the Homestead Act. It's 160 acres, I think. Exactly. And mm. that, that, now, that principle recognizes that people have right to natural resources. Because if they don't have, if, if you don't, have access to natural resources, that's equivalent to capital punishment. That's equivalent to a death sentence. And that is something that capitalism doesn't understand, and that's something that communism doesn't understand. Communism arbitrarily redistributes according to the politcommissar who should get what plot of land. Right, it all becomes political. All ownership and power is in the state hands that's rather than in a private sector. Wh while, mm. while we're talking about that. But what would, what would George say? I mean, you, you George said George says, sees George it different says, than everybody else. George says, People work the land, you own the land conditionally. You own the land conditionally for your use. Mm -hmm. But you can hold land out of use that nobody uses just for speculative purposes. Give you another example. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was made director of the Henry George School five and a half. Yes, congratulations. They're lucky to get you. I hope they're treating you OK. Five they have a gem at the helm. At the Henry George School, you, I'm here to. You, 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 uh, you make me blush. No, I, well, I, I want to make you blush. You, yeah. L if you, if you go for a walk on a nice day, not today, on a nice day. Nice you, day. I don't want to go for a walk. Well, today. you you live in the neighborhood, so I know, you go I'm for a walk. You wa go for a walk mm. in a ni let's say a nice sunny day. You go for no. a walk ten blocks east, west, north, south uh -huh. of where we are yeah. in, in Lower Manhattan. Mm. You will find five and a half years ago there was practically no commercial uh, real estate space empty. Now, mm -hmm. five and a half years later, there's a lot empty. Yeah. And, and the statistics are between 29 and 40 percent of the commercial real estate space in Lower Manhattan is empty. Really? And okay. people are holding that land, or not land, that land, and the commercial real estate out of use for speculative purposes. They're waiting for the Dow Jones to hit uh, 15, whatever, yeah, right. 20. And then they say, okay, we cash in on the big rents. But yeah. what it does, it makes the rent more expensive for everybody else. Mm -hmm. Kids who are coming out of college, they can't open anything because they can't afford the, 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 the uh, astronomical rents. Uh -huh. A young couple that wants to uh, uh, have babies and, and have a plot of land, they have to take out a mortgage and uh -huh. they have to pay down the mortgage and never get to the house. Right. So that is something that is damaging to the economy as a whole. So Henry George says, in order to avoid monopolization, and speculation with land and natural resources, you tax land. You tax natural resources. 
and you you don't take taxes for anything else so you get a if you have 30% income tax or 30% income and capital gains tax you get that back you have that in your pocket mm -hmm. you can reinvest that that means the economy gets a boom what would be the effect of that was it able to be instituted at all it was very very popular turn of the century yes uh, theodore roosevelt a lot of others and everything uh, was he able to instigate it? Uh, what were the forces against it? What have been the outcome? How much of his vision was able to become real to inform our understanding of things? And what is the relevancy in terms of now as we talk in the year 2009 of his way of seeing things on that single tax idea? Now we have, thank you for the question, we, th the largest application of Henry George's ideas was in China, 1912, Dr. Chiang Kai, Ch Dr. Excuse me, Dr. Sun Yat-sen Sun became Yat -sen. the president of Republican China. That was mm -hmm. post Mandarin and pre Maoist China. Right. For January first, nineteen hundred twelve, Dr. Sun Yat-sen was a Georgist. He became the president. Was he really? Yes, he I was didn't a Georgist. That. Yes, he was. I'll be done. And for, okay. for until his death, until nineteen twenty-five, they were working on implementing the Georgist tax system in China. No fooling. Now, okay, yeah. Chiang Kai Shek, yeah. who married into the same family, mm. who became his his successor continued his work until 1949. They had fights with the warlords, but mm. Chiang Kai-shek also continued to implement the uh, Georgia's uh, economic policy in China. They were driven by the Maoists and the Stalinists. They were driven from the mainland to Formosa, Thailand. Okay. Uh, to Taiwan, I'm sorry. Yeah, Formosa, Taiwan. Taiwan. Yeah, yeah. And to this day, Taiwan has one of the most Georgia's constitutions on the planet. No fooling. Okay, so, that's So surgery. that's, there are pockets, there are places in history and there are places in, on the planet where this has been instituted. Okay. Now, Henry George has, has run for mayor twice, talk about mayoral races. Mm. I don't know if I'm, I'm, I'm uh, uh, committing less majesty, majesty here, but if I'm saying what, who would vote for Bloomberg if, if Bloomberg didn't have any money? Mm. Are we voting for the man? Mm. I'm not saying he's bad. Mm. Or are we voting for his money? Now, George would say, look at the productive capacity. Don't look at the money first. Now, George ran for mayor twice. He was uh, cheated out of his, uh, his probably his victory in 18, uh, 1886. Mm -hmm. Some of the ballot boxes with his names in were found in the Hudson, it appears. And in 1897, he ran again, and he died, in, in, I think, a few nights before the election I was see. over. Uh -huh. But in order to see, to bring it back to 2009, to bring it back to, 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 to this present period, I think we have another clip. Yeah, we do. We want to get to that. Yeah. And that, that, that's it. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. That clip is a documentary that's coming out November 13th in uh, a, a, a theater, as a theatrical release, uh, November 13th here in New York, a little okay. later in Los Angeles. Okay. And it is a documentary, one and a half hours with. Uh, Perkins, the economic hitman. Oh, Stieg Perkins, yeah. Stieglitz, yeah. The, uh, the, the economist. Uh, Amirta um, Sen, uh, a yeah, number of the top-notch yeah. uh, uh -huh. top notch economists. Mm -hmm. They're pronouncing themselves on the state of the economy on the planet, and they're pronouncing themselves on remedies to abolish poverty. Okay. So the film is called The End of Poverty, Question Mark, and What Can Be Done to Abolish Poverty. Wonderful. And those are some ra major names. Uh, are they invoking uh, George? The, the the whole film is based on the George's premise and on the George's theory, and it, it, it and it and it brings out the George's solution also. Is it stated such? Yeah. In the thing. Okay. Well, yeah, we got a brief thirty-second clip or something. It's coming out in November. Yeah. Okay. This giant, he maybe we can resurrect it from the past as he deserves. So let's see if we can't run that little clip now. I guess it only goes thirty seconds. Yeah. But it's something we can look for, and we want to get it here at the end. So let's see. If if they can run that, because that's a major of what Stiglitz and Sen and all that you're talking about, and they do it in the name of Henry George. Yeah. Oh, that's very interesting because um, mostly you're just getting things. Here we go. Okay. In a world where there is so much wealth, with modern cities and plentiful resources, how can we still have so much poverty? Where do we have to look to understand how it all started? Where some started to become rich and others poor? 
Oh, that's really interesting. That's a huge thing. I look forward to that. Is it out anywhere now, or is it's, it? It's it's going to be. It, it's going to have its world premiere. It was in Cannes last year. It, oh, it really? Did very well in Cannes. Okay. And it's going to come out November thirteenth uh, in a down in the in the village. And it it basically was produced by the Henry George School has a number of sister and yeah. affiliate organizations, right. and uh -huh. one of them is the Robert Schachenbach. Uh, oh yes, of course, Robert Schachenbach. Robert yeah. Schachenbach Foundation is the publisher of our textbooks, mm -hmm. and a number of I'm on the board of the of that uh, uh, foundation yes, now I'm familiar, uh, as yeah. a trustee, uh -huh. and and Schachenbach, uh, the board of Schachenbach, a number of years ago with Clifford Cobb, then uh, director and now executive producer of this film, he took uh -huh. a very they took. Uh, uh, together, a very co courageous decision, I think, and that decision was we're going to go with the times, we're going to go into the new media, we're going to have Henry George not just in print, mm -hmm. in the print media, yeah, yeah. we're going to have him on air, we're going to make a documentary Wonderful. which is going to have theatrical release. Okay, it's not out now. It will be out November 13th. November it, it has the 13th, world release. everybody on the calendar, put a big red letter, November 13th, uh, the uh, thing, and that's what we're looking for, really, although some people because uh, we wanted to talk about the meltdown yes. that we had, and we went back to Mr. Geithner and Summers, and yes. they're gone, and yes. now it's gone. Yes. To, so they're saying everything's okay, you know, no. and the, and the rich are going to get richer, and we're going to keep going. And this is providing an alternative way of creating and distributing, uh, creating wealth yes. in all of its aspects, and distributing buying power among the people to clear the market because there's a capability of providing for everybody and even the ecology that is newly emerging and the people of the world don't have enough to be able to purchase that which we're able to do so we don't have a system in place that lets us do which technologically we know we're capable of doing but we don't have a way of distributing demand to the people to clear the market is that more or less the problem we're confronted with or is it it's got nuance but what, what, what we got to get some money to the people well, we've got to get some money to the people. If if you want to understand better the problem of poverty and how to solve it and how to end world poverty now, mm -hmm. that's in the film. That is addressed in the film. This issue. Wonderful. Yeah. Now going back to Geithner and Sumner's and and the 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 present economic situation, yeah. they bailed out. They bailed out uh, capitalism. They bailed out the big capitalist com companies um, b to save capitalism, to mm. save, as you say, Roosevelt and now Obama are saving capitalism. But what has to happen, what happened in the 1930s with Roosevelt, it was the uh, WPA, Work Progress Administration. They put people back to work. Mm -hmm. Okay, you need the money system. You need to have the banking in place. But the money needs to get down to the people, and people need to be put to work. We Why do they have to be put to work in order to get money? Why, why don't they have a system of distributing ownership of the wealth as a way of distributing owner, uh, income to the people? Why doesn't everybody own and then get income by their ownership so they can do what they want to do rather than what the masters of the capital assets tell them they have to do in a wage slave way? Why do we have to stick with wage slavery? That's, that's Kelso, right? Yeah, okay. it would be. Kelso and others, the zeitgeist and other things, yeah. So if, if we get to this point, we're back with the satisfaction of needs. And, and, and until the time when we have a fully robotic, commu a fully robotic